Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Gita with us here. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Gita. The book has been out for almost a year, I think. Um, but you have done an uh, HLF online. Uh, but I wonder if this is the first in English in Hyderabad. No, not really. There okay. was uh, one of the first meetings was in Anveshi. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so I stand corrected. Um, anyway, uh, to start the conversation, you know, I like I think everybody who has uh, read the book uh, deeply engrossed, uh, taken up, and as I was joking. I am now in Hyderabad, but I'm a kind of outsider. And reading the book was, in some way, an uh, introduction to Hyderabad society. Uh, other than the ready landlords of Ibrahim Patna, you know, they fortunately, <laughs> I don't know them. So, yeah. Anyway, um, for me, you know, the book has many things at many levels. It's not possible to cover everything in this conversation. Uh, just but to give an idea to the um, those of us who here have not read the book, um, it said there is a lot about a struggle of a, a person from a middle class family struggling against tradition, struggling to do what uh, she wanted to do. Um, then there is, uh, it's a story also about a young person who was involved in the 60s and 70s, 70s perhaps, uh, with the Naxalism of the time as a student. Then the most important part of, not most important part, I mean an important part of the book, your work with the Sangam in Ibrahim Patnam, the struggle over there um, with people, the how Karam Chedu changed your, uh, the way you looked at uh, issues. And finally, uh, for me somewhat, uh, well, I wouldn't say the most interesting, the reflections on violence, constitutionalism and politics. Uh, if possible, I'd like to cover all of them, but obviously you can't do justice to everything. Um, maybe we could uh, start with uh, talking about the Sangam. Um, you know, for me, what uh, struck me of the memoir is that it wasn't just about yourself. Uh, you have been talking about the work with the Sangam. The voices of the people over there are so prominent in the book. Uh, I can think of a few names like Satyama, Shankaraya, even people like uh, Juttu Narsaya who lost their, who lost his life. Uh, it was that, did that come spontaneously to you as you wrote it or did you make a conscious attempt to let them speak? It came spontaneously because, uh, uh, I mean they gave so much to me. Yeah. They made me what I was in, in that period and uh, we worked together, yeah. so it was not a struggle, it was not my struggle, it was their struggle of which I was part of. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, it, you speak about over a period of uh, I think almost uh, 10 years, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and to talk about Ibrahim Patnam itself, you know, um, uh, I mean I was shocked when I read the condition, of course it was 40 years ago. But it was just less than 100 kilometers from Hyderabad. Uh, those conditions at that time uh, are truly shocking. I mean, I, in, in, see, in the early 80s, I wasn't working, but I was doing a lot of field work in rural Maharashtra, interior Maharashtra, you know, in uh, western um, um, Vidarbha. Uh, things were bad, but not like the conditions that you, um, uh, you uh, speak about. Uh, the change that comes, you talk about very, uh, it came about with a lot of struggle, with a lot of um, effort. Um, but now, I'm just wanting to, uh, wondering whether you have been back recently and seen the change that has happened. You know, and what kind of change has it uh, taken yeah. place? I went there last month. Someone wanted to, someone who couldn't believe what you said, uh, Rangaredi district was. 30 years ago, wanted to come now and see. So I accompanied uh, my nephew actually to the area. And I've been going for weddings and other, mm, when they call me for some family functions, I do go. Uh, one is uh, now that it is almost a suburb of Hyderabad, all the young people 
uh, work in Hyderabad. Nobody works on the fields, no young person works on the fields, no young person will work, no woman will work in the landlord's houses. There is no uh, work with any individual employer. All of them come to city to work. Mm -hmm. So that gives them a lot of independence and self-respect. And then I did not see a single thatched house anywhere. About 30, 40 years ago, there were no uh, all were thatched houses. Mm. Now, I did not see a single thatched house. And they tell me every house has a bathroom constructed inside the house. And um, all the women were no, wore nighties, I mean, which I also thought was a revolution of sorts. Yeah. And uh, children were all educated. Children were all, uh, all the g girls were going to college, mm. which is a big thing. I mean, forget primary school, but all the girls were going to college. Uh, the sad thing is also that. And now, when there are earlier, uh, when there were weddings, it was just, you know, um, um, Dodubiyam and Pachipulsu or uh, Jonorote and some Karam. Now, of course, there's chicken, mutton, and there's ice cream and gulab jamun, uh, maybe fried rice, the same paneer, uh, whatever, paneer pulao. And then mounds of waste, like we see in our own weddings, mounds of waste. So even they are also wasting a lot of food. That was one sad thing I saw. Uh, but does it mean that, uh, you know, all of your struggle was about land and wages. Does that mean that there's no longer an uh, issue out there? If you say that young people, are they, then the landlords bringing, are there landlords there still? Are they bringing labor from outside, in which case there would still be these issues of uh, wages? Uh, or is agriculture itself now being, abandoned and you know plots are being uh, developed no, this is this is not a typical area rangaredi district at that time the struggle was so intense but the landlords are all powerful they all stayed in city uh, they were close to the political leaders close to the chief minister home minister uh, and uh, a patwari in a village was more powerful than a collector i mean this was very commonly accepted of rangaredi district which is why the power struggle there was so intense with them so, but now, uh, Rangaradi land is so valuable. I mean, like one acre will sell for so many crores. So, agriculture is just out all over his engineering colleges, pharma cities, that city, something else, a hospital. The whole area, I think, um, up to about 60 kilometers uh, out of city limits has become uh, not just peri-urban, mm -hmm. suburban. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, um, Culture, cultivation is no longer uh, primary means of livelihood, not at all. Agricultural labor is not the primary means of livelihood. But uh, the land issue at that time was important because what land our people got, they were able to, uh, um, some of them sold it and then moved further away to Kartal or Kalvakurti where you sold one acre here and bought ten acres there. So those people who could not shift to other occupations, have been able to shift to agriculture as well, so uh, certainly the livelihoods have improved yeah. vastly. Uh, if I can go, move back in time as it were, um, and of your involvement with um, Naxalism, uh, I mean, uh, I hope um, those who read the book will read it in detail. Um, I want to talk a bit about, you know, looking back, you um, are critical of them, on two counts, at least two counts. One is their uh, unwillingness to look at um, feminist issues, and more important, their unwillingness to look at caste at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but even as you and you're also critical of their wanton violence. By wanton, I use the word uh, uh, partly carefully because you say, especially the violence against. Uh, small officials, so-called informants, was uh, completely unacceptable. And um, yet you, you looking back, you say that, you know, there were many wrong things they have done, but there were struggles and they, I think the word you use, spine, you know, it, mm. they gave you a uh, uh, spine. Uh, now, uh, how do you see the, um, not the current moment, but looking back again at that time. Uh, there was a lot of idealism, but there was also a certain, uh, not a certain, there was a huge amount of uh, violence. And while you reflect positively in the book about, uh, you know, the philosophy as such, you see many things went wrong. You know? uh, 
uh, so is it to do with the the way it was the movement was organized or was there something inevitable about you know how it developed i think it's inevitable because the way um, movements are organized it's not just the left movement the feminist movement is also not willing to look at his past critically neither is the uh, dalit movement willing to look at his friends or its enemies critically so it's a question of how we construct movements is that uh, i mean any movement has to be based on empathy i mean i think the basic uh, crux of any activity towards a fellow human being is empathy you feel for the other person so you are active and working with that other person but uh, empathy can also turn into some kind of sectarianism or authoritarianism and mm -hmm. that's what uh, has happened with the left movement i think the leaders who have come in at various points of time have been great people uh, and even now those people who continue the left people because the, uh, um, the left is also a, you know a springboard for getting into politics now if a young person in telangana wants to join bjp or congress a young person from say an scbc background he is not able to join uh, he is not given position because the Cong congress and bjp they've all got their sons nephews daughters daughters in law filling the thing so they're not going to be able to get into it so they join these left politics learn how to work with people and then get a springboard into mainstream politics mm -hmm. so in that kind of a uh, uh, situation um, when the left is sectarian or authoritarian, today for example, the student group with which I was involved, that is the PDSU. There was one PDSU, today there are four PDSUs, there are four progressive organizations of women, there are four cultural wings, all, all have the same manifesto. To the last full stop, they have the same manifesto. Why are there four groups? Because of the kind of democratic centralism which these parties uh, practice which in a sense is uh, whatever comes from top is accepted uncritically, unequivocally and people have to listen. And I think that's not to do with the left alone, it's a, it's the, it's a kind right. of hierarchy which has come with caste in India. That whoever is, is, is a, we, are a, we are a ladder in India. Mm -hmm. So I, everybody listens to the Brahmin. Uh, somebody else, uh, the uh, people below the reddies will listen to the reddies and the people at the bottom of the pile will have to listen to everybody. So this kind of obedience or expectation of obedience is what mm, defeats democracy in, yeah. in all these kind of movements, yeah. so not just the left, yeah. I think in other movements as well. Um, I'd like to talk about violence but before that I'd like to share a uh, statement in the book, we're talking about leaders. Uh, Gita writes about, you know, when she was young in her 20s, 30s, and I'm sure she feels so even now, that all leaders have feet of clay. Uh, yeah, many of us think so. But she also says that she, when she first heard of Ambedkar and read him, she said, you know, she was not uh, totally enthralled, you know, just because he was B.R. Ambedkar and, you know, he was involved in the making of the constitution. If I'm not right, you say so mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, Talking about empathy and the nature of politics, I'll come to that a bit. But before that, um, you know, staying with the ML movement, uh, it couldn't have been easy for you to break away. You know? I mean, because we know that, uh, especially when you have to work underground, there are these strong um, emotional um, bonds that are developed. Uh, then also, of course, after you break away, there is a the threat of uh, in retaliatory violence. Uh, so, can you give us a sense of what it was when you finally broke away, I think in 76, you know, you kind of uh, uh, left, you know? Yeah, the end of 76. Uh, well, if emergency hadn't come, uh, maybe we wouldn't have left and continued for a long more time. But uh, uh, the left parties, at least the um, radical left parties have a very strict protocol maintaining for, you know, who can meet whom. If you are in a particular district committee or a town committee, you can only meet your members. You can't meet members from the next district committee or that. So everybody is like, you will only know people in your cell. You will not know people in other cells. Now what happened with emergency was all, I mean, everybody's uh, houses got raided. I mean, even if you're underground, you're, somebody was arrested, he gave uh, information and ev people's houses got arrested. So you you're running around searching for shelter. So when you search for shelter, you go wherever you get shelter, no? you may go to, so the, some people from our, who are our friends who had gone to the forest came back to the city to stay with us. And then 
we found that things are not what I mean. The information which the party has been had been giving to us was not true. That uh, we thought the forests were a liberated area, and uh, they told us that they were just you know running from place to place. There was no water to drink. People were not sheltering them. It was such a difficult time. So when these stories came out about the violence in villages, the lack of preparation for. I mean, when you're declaring armed struggle, you have to be prepared for it or some kind of preparation, the total lack of preparation. And when these questions were raised, um, we were told to shut up. We were said, this is an armed struggle. This is not a debating society. You can't ask these questions. Uh, you know, what kind of people are you? You see the other party carder, le mante le star, kuso mante kusuntaru, mere enti vanni adigedi, mere students me ku talakai laun nai. And Jepi, they told us to keep shut. And that's, that's, that's not something we were going to take because, um, I mean, we had, we had come, we were not like somebody's relative son or daughter getting into the movement. We had come in on our own independently because of the influence of George Reddy. And we, many of us had given up our academic studies. I mean, we could have had bright careers. We gave up all that and came into that. And we were not going to listen. And, we, and our parents, we wouldn't listen to our parents telling, you know, listen to what I say. Why are you going to listen to some party leader saying, listen to what I say? So there was this tug of war for some time. They cut off money because, you know, you need money, little money to live. It was a very difficult period. And then finally, there was all this exchange of documents. When there is, when somebody leaves the party, you write huge documents. I mean, if you read them now, they won't make sense. But you know, throwing allegations on some on on us or whatever. Many party documents came out, and then eventually we left. It was very traumatic, because I know uh, that when we when we moved to the north, we moved to Delhi, Ghaziabad because we thought that is you know far away enough from either police or retaliatory violence for the party i wanted to commit suicide on a number of occasions i said there's nothing left for me to live for i've cut my bridges with my family with my um, studies with everything with my old friends to come into this party and then this party has let me down so badly i mean what have i to live for so i later learned that uh, there were several women who had nervous breakdowns when they left the party. And this was something which affected women more than men. I think when women commit themselves to something, we commit ourselves more completely than men do. Uh, mm. And men always probably have more um, escape, uh, safety walls and escape routes. You can get back, slink back slowly into society. You can get a job somewhere. You're not marked or noted. Whereas, you know, as women, we were like noted, you know, and how do you get back? How do I get back to my parents when I've sort of cut my roots, with, cut my contact with them? Who are the friends who I can meet? Because you're so frightened of meeting uh, anybody who's joined the Naxalite movement. So there was no going back. And uh, maybe it's because we are, um, yeah, I think so it affected. I heard that more women... Uh, had nervous breakdowns when they left the party. So it was a difficult time for us. Yeah, um, you've written about that movingly in the book. Uh, staying with uh, your time in Delhi, uh, I wonder, you know, you write about, you have written in the book about, um, you know, coming close to suicide. You have written about talking to Cyril about this and, you know, about uh, you also written about the work you did in uh, Basti in Ghaziabad. Uh, we have spoken about it uh, other way. Um, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a bit about it. Uh, just to, you know, when um, uh, Geeta and Cyril were in Delhi, in Ghaziabad, with the help of uh, Cyril's brother, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were staying in a Basti and uh, Geeta worked, rather taught the children of the people of the Basti, who were essentially Dalit families. Balmikis. Balmikis. And she, uh, had, she goes back about 30 years later. Mm. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us about your, when you went back and to that Basti, mm -hmm. what you saw. And, you know. When we went to the north, we thought, you know, it was emergency at that time. And one never knew when emergency was going to be lifted. It's just like we're waiting now for, when is this? Um, Modi government going to go, when are we going to get some relief, you know, you never know. 
So at emergency, certainly when nobody expected that in 77, Indira Gandhi would lift emergency. So we prepared other identities. We wrote the exam in Punjabi and got a 10th class Punjabi certificate, changed our names. And then uh, Ghaziabad was like, you know, far enough from Delhi, but also close enough to meet other friends when we wanted to. So we went to Ghaziabad and asked them, who are the poorest people in Ghaziabad? Went around the town asking. And they said, they are the Balmikis. The Balmikis are the Methars. Hyderabad also has Methar uh, population, sufficient Methar population. So we took up a room uh, in one of the Balmiki uh, bastis and we said, you know, here we are, what do you want us to do? I mean, this was in sharp reaction when we were in the ML, we'd go around to the bastis and tell them, look, this is what you have to do. We, we're going to organize for pattas, we're going to organize for water, we're going to protest against the CM, against the ML, you come along with us. It was all a um, top to bottom thing in the, when we had worked earlier in the ML. So here the, the thing was to turn it topsy-turvy and do what work people wanted us to do. So they said, you teach our in, uh, children um, English and you teach our women to stitch. And so, uh, they wanted English at that time. I mean, I think it's such a far-sighted demand that they made. I was thinking, what is this? They don't want us to teach them Hindi. I mean, I could teach because I studied in Kendra Vedal. I could teach Hindi. But they wanted English. And uh, women, I taught uh, stitching. And, uh, uh, but you know, you teaching uh, English and stitching doesn't get you anywhere near to revolution. And I still wanted at that time had dreams of revolution in some other way there should be a way to make a revolution not maybe in the cpml but something else and so it was a very uh, after two and a half years it was very disappointing and then when there was a chance to come back to hyderabad again i mean the police cases were i don't know lifted but police no longer after us and the party also willing to you know let us be not shoot us dead or anything so then we thought we can come back to hyderabad i was quite glad to come back uh, you know, quite fed up of English language teaching. But I went there when I was writing the book and I had gone on a visit to Delhi. A friend said, why don't you go back to that area? I said, you know, you will never be able to find it because Gazi has, Ghaziabad has also become part of Delhi. So I went on searching, searching, searching and then uh, finally found a, a, a basti which they said, this is the basti where possibly you could find. And then they said, where will you find a Balmiki? You worked 40 years ago and no Balmiki lives beyond 40 because he drinks so much that he dies. You won't find anybody who you taught at that time. But then I found one man whose brother I had taught. And then slowly some more people gathered. And then I found out that these children whom I taught at that time were doing so well now. And then, you know, nowadays everybody has cell phones. So the phones went to uh, Amritsar and to Bangalore and to Guwahati, wherever these, these boys are working. I don't know what happened to the girls. Nobody told me anything about the girls. They probably got married off, but at least they would have been educating their children, I think. So it was very gratifying to know that all these um, boys, at least, had got good jobs and um, um, uh, had done well in life. And then, um, I met them later when I went to Delhi for some other meeting. They came over to the press club to see me and they brought their children to show. The children are now, you know, PhD scholars, engineers. So it was very gratifying to see that some small thing, some small bit of work that one had done long time back and which actually was, um, at that time, I didn't think of it as anything important, had resulted in some lives being changed. So, uh, you know, it's not just, revolution which is gratifying it's also these small daily acts of kindness and empathy which also make an effect yeah thank you for sharing that story and if i can say you also said one of those who called you when you were there was now the airport manager at chandigarh right yeah mm. so, amritsar amritsar yeah um yeah those are gratifying but if we can go back to the question of violence which you discussed a lot in your book um and a fair bit uh, you know, I, you say that you're explicitly against both state violence and uh, organized violence by the Naxal. But you also say at one point that it cannot be rejected as a counter strategy. And I think there you give that uh, very um, nice example of what Emilia Pankhurst said. Oh. Uh, what without a, a broken glass pain is an act of politics. You know? Yes. 
Uh, what do you mean by counter strategy? You know, it's, uh, I, I don't mean strategy at all. I don't mean strategy at all. Sometimes in a movement, when people get together, when there is an intense uh, struggle going on, people may take up acts of violence. Those acts of violence, I think, spontaneous, un, uh, um, unpremeditated acts of violence, I don't think we should condemn. I think even Nagzalbari, the start of Nagzalbari was when police had caught uh, some tribals, taken them away to, you know, beaten up one tribal to death, when the tribals took out their bows and arrows and shot one policeman dead. That was, for me, not an act of violence which I would condemn. When um, the, the violence which is planned by any organized group like a political party or like a student organization like um, when we come to secretary, let's throw stones. Yeah, I mean, this is what we also, some of us planned at that time when we were students. Those kinds of things, I think, no. But I do remember, and I talk in the book about, I came to know later that women, when they used to uh, have dharnas, our women, in front of the police stations in Ibrahim Patam, and I used to carry chili powder with them. And then I came to know about it later. I said, why chili powder? They said, kotani kuchina pudu. Uh, so I wouldn't condemn that either. See, mm. so I think there's a difference between spontaneous violence by people and uh, uh, violence by organized groups. Yeah. Um, moving, uh, moving ahead to you know talking. You, as I said, you speak also about uh, constitutional approach to politics, etc. Uh, I found one discussion very um, engrossing. You talk about, you know, uh, learning from the people in Ibrahim Patnam that we, we meaning uh, you as a political activist, you see, you are trained to see things as right versus wrong. Mm. And you say that, but the people don't look at it always that way. It's a question of right versus wrong. And also, you have to look at it at what is doable. Yes. You know? And I found one sentence, if I can read that out, you know, about, you know, it's a guide, guide to politics, perhaps. People made alternatives, they created alternatives, and they had patience. Mm. So that, uh, I, I mean, is that something that you learned from your work in Ibrahim Bajnam? Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, when I went there, I, I, if somebody had given me a knife or something, um, I chop off all the heads of all the landlords. I was so angry with them all the time. I would have been uh, violent myself. But every time people would stop and say, no, this is not it, this is not it. So there's so many times that they pulled me back. Not that, you know, I would have done anything maybe, but the, the urge was there. And they explained to me why that would not work and why we had to follow a different path. Um, that taught me a lot. And in all those, uh, every decision was taken in a village meeting. We never took any decision, four of us, five of us sitting inside some room. Every decision was taken in open village meetings. And in all the village meetings, the beginning, they'd always tell me to shut up. They always would tell me, let people talk. So when I heard people talking, and they talk all night, sometimes it take two nights you know, day they'd go back to work, night again the discussion would start and go on till 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock the night and they talk and talk and talk till some kind of um, strategy was evolved. And the other thing was when they had, um, there were also, um, uh, what do you call, conflicts between them. And even the conflicts between them, I would see it as right or wrong. If a woman was wronged, you know, she should have justice. And they would see it as, yes, the woman should have justice, but what is the kind of compromise that you can effect that will also be accepted by the boy side? Which means nobody should go to police. Basically, nobody should go to police. Nobody should go to an outside authority. And you, you should effect as fair a compromise as you can within the group. So, which means sometimes the compromises were unsatisfying, but certainly far better uh, than if there were, had been no discussion and compromise. Mm. So, that is what, uh, you know, I really learnt that um, we people who come from outside and who want to work with any particular group, whatever group we want to work with, we want to bring about change and we want to um, state things, you know, in black and white and pursue them. But people um, want to create alternatives and they have the patience to wait until 
a critical mass of them are agreeable to it so that there is no conflict within the people uh, if i can change track a bit now and then come back to uh, politics before we round up with looking at politics today um, you know one of the things that a reader feels is you know on reading the book you had such a, a difficult time growing up you know, um, with your family you know uh, and later in your work as well uh, being let down by associates friends etc um, but at the same time looking back now there is there's a strong streak of forgiveness and empathy i mean you write about mm. your relationship with your uh, parents later mm. you know, in spite of the horrible things that happened but there is also towards some others there's not anger uh, but uh, it shows that you have not forgotten you know? uh, now a year after you written this or uh, been published do you wish that some of those uh, aspects you had not uh, written about you left that that be mm -hmm. no, you must specify what aspect now you don't uh, hedge around <laughs> the uh, uh, issue you s say well, up front okay i mean once there, there was i mean i it's i also read it about a year ago so uh, for uh, i mean the, the even towards the family you talk about um, your parents but you say the others in the family they have not forgotten and nor have you forgotten oh actually the book was very good the book helped me um, you know mend fences with my family um, when uh, when i told my sisters you know this corona you have these whatsapp conversations in one of the conversations i said i'm writing about the book they said don't write wait till we die after we die you publish it so mm. i said no that's not possible i i try not to be malicious or hurtful but i am going to write and then um, i mean it was a fait accompli so it was okay after the book was out i didn't send them the book i don't know whether they read it um, uh, but the children read it and uh, my nieces and nephews some of them wherever they are they read the book and they've come back uh, <laughs> and then my sisters also now they are proud of me I don't know exactly what they are proud of because I have maligned them pretty badly but they seem to be proud of me when they talk elsewhere so in a sense and then we've also brought up this issue of I've not discussed it for 40 years the shock treatment that they gave I've been able to discuss it with them I said why did you do it my parents I can understand why they did it because some doctor misled them but you were educated two of you were employed I mean highly educated how could you have you know uh, agree to this why could you not have done this i was able to say that and they were able to give their reasons which i think is um, some i mean bridges have been built mm -hmm. and about the other incident which you refused to name do you no, want no, me to no. bring it up no no you don't no. have to okay no but, uh, actually uh, what i do remember and in fact today when i was going through it the specific thing about with your parents because i remember that and also about your sisters because mm -hmm. this is a postscript we don't know about uh, you know in the book you say that uh, the sister your sis your you're still unhappy with your sisters and your yes. sisters are unhappy with you that you're writing yeah uh, coming back to the politics why you know you you speak about uh, in one place uh, mm, as an alternative kind of politics the work done by the नर्मदा बचाओ आंदोलन चक्ते छत्तीसगढ़ मुक्ति मोर्चा और इन द चिपको मूवमेंट्स एंड इवन यू टॉक अबाउट द अंबेडकर राइट पाथ ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यू वर्किंग द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन दैट यू फाइंड स्पेसेस इन नाउ टुडे इन 2023 लुकिंग एट यू नो व्हाट इज अराउंड अस नाउ हाउ डू यू सी पॉलिटिक्स एंड सोसाइटी टुडे इट्स सो डिफरेंट फ्रॉम द 70s 80s द बैटल्स दैट one has to fight today are so different you know one perhaps would not even imagine that uh, today the um, main battle would be against uh, hindutva and not about against the uh, landlords so as somebody i mean i don't i think this term lapsed revolutionary i by the way uh, if i can share it with the audience i uh, i think i mentioned it to you also this lapsed revolutionary you are still a revolutionary in certain respects the other thing is you know the the guns don't figure in the book there is even that incident where you are so angry that without telling you they sent you with a trunk of 
guns to um, Varanasi. Uh, it doesn't figure. I mean, no, the landlords had guns. Landlords had guns, but yeah. the revolutionary did not have. No. Uh, okay, no, just to come back to the polity, how do you see today's politics, you know, compared to that? I mean, you fought those battles, those issues were of a different kind. And now suddenly in front of us, I use the word suddenly, deliberately, because we didn't uh, see this, or rather it was perhaps we were blind to it, we didn't see this 10 years ago, you know. Uh, and now uh, it's a different uh, kind of situation, setting altogether where perhaps even mass movements, you use the term mass movements, like right? those of the NBA or the CMM or the CHIPCO, may not be effective. Hmm? I wouldn't agree with you on that. Um, even in the 1970s, nobody thought that working in villages was the main work. At that time, one people said, fight Indira Gandhi's authoritarianism, this is fascism. If you remember, whatever we are saying today was said in 74, she is fact, Indira is India, India is Indira, all those kind of things. So there were those kind of slogans and work in villages was not necessarily considered the main work. And uh, so I don't agree that things have changed, I mean, there is bound to be a change. But I think what has happened is, um, we have gone away from working with people. I think working with people is at the kernel of any change movement. Um, I see less and less, I see more and more social media work going on. You know, you put up something on social media, you think you've done your bit. When, when we were younger, we went around hostels room by room, room, room after room, catching people, talking to them. And then we worked in villages, worked in bastis. But now people put out, you know, have a press conference or put out social media. Somebody comes and tells you a story and then you think that's a movement. I think that personal communication and personal and uh, 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 discussion of the people who are, I, whether it's a basti or whether it's a village, a discussion at that level, you still can't, that's still the basic mainstay of any movement. So. Uh, just because technology is in our hands and we think networking and advocacy, I think networking and advocacy have become far more important today than they ever were. So even NGOs who are working, work largely in networking and advocacy. So I think if you, if we want to uh, fight Hindu India, work with at the grassroots level is still important. And if you see over the last 30 years, who are the people who are all, you know, wearing those orange stuff and uh, in the Vinayak Chaturthi procession? They're all people from the Bastis. They're all scheduled cars from the Bastis. So why don't we have a strong scheduled car Basti movement? Why don't we have a strong movement with the Dalits in the Bastis? Without that, how do you fight uh, uh, any kind of Hindu majoritarianism unless you have work in the Bastis with Dalits, with Muslims in the villages? I think that is still the. Um, should be the mainstay of any movement and that is what our young people are not doing. I mean, I'm not blaming them, but there seems to be so much of a, a dependence on social media and an advocacy that people think the job is done. And also I think there's so much of aspirations after 1990 liberalism, so many avenues have opened that um, and also maybe people are exhausted. There's also something as exhaustion. When people have fought movements and get tired, you require a generation, one generation to rest and the next generation to then take up. But I think when that takes up, it will again be back to the grassroots. Without those kind of movements, we won't be able to go forward. Ma'am, there is an AGM in Telugu states. Who is a comrade means when you add Kamma plus Reddy, it becomes comrade. So, uh, for the past 25 years since my college days, I have been keenly observing this left, left movements with respect to Dalits, but I don't find any leadership at least at state level and national level from Dalit community, especially from SCS to Y. I'm not uh, criticizing or supporting the left on this movement, but there have been uh, Maroj Virana was there, he's from the Dalit community, and all the Dalit leaders who are there today have come up have from the, uh, from the left movement, Gaddar or um, uh, Gorati Venkanna, so many other people have come up from the left, mo left movement. In fact, I would say because the Dalits have been, have been so deeply involved with the left movement, politics has got screwed. 
I would not go to that traditional argument which you are saying. I think the left had left lots of people alone. We'd have a more creative movement in the two Telugu states. But there have been leaders from Dalits also. Why not? I wanted to know what, in your opinion, are the potential areas of uh, movement uh, right now in present era, uh, which, uh, as you mentioned, the youth are not uh, very involving and taking up stand for. So, what are the potential areas of movement that you think has been? should bring change in the society. I really don't know. I mean, I'll have to think about it, so which means I really don't know. But at one point, some 10 years ago, I thought the Polavaram project was, you know, just asking for mobilization. The Polavaram project came in, was steamrolled by the government. And that was one area where we failed the people, we failed to mobilize people. And in whole area, whole people have been kicked out from that area. The polover was an opportunity which we lost. Really we lost not just in terms of Adivasi livelihoods, but in terms of habitat and ecology. We really lost out on that. I, um, I grew up in a rich family, not the underground directly, the PIC So at that time, you know, religious we had relatives in both of the uh, parties. So there was a lot of, okay, our uh, ideology is good, but the implementation is bad, even when we talk about Russia and China, maybe we need to talk about that. Uh, so I want uh, you to, uh, you know, maybe in retrospect, do you think what were the uh, things that probably you would have done differently, you would have not individually, the party, the party, things you would have done differently to uh, maybe cause or affect a, larger I think two things. One is when you're working with people, respect people. Respect people, take them into your confidence, tell them what you want to do and ask them what needs to be done. And finally, go by what they want, what they need to be done, even if it is not your revolutionary policy. I think that's the first basic uh, issue. The second issue is within your own group, within the left group, uh, this idea of democratic centrism should be thrown out, lock, stock and barrel. This was something which uh, the, the communists adopted two centuries ago, democratic centrism, which our left parties continue to swear by, should have a far more open uh, uh, system of inner organizational functioning. We hear of examples like um, in Chiapas in Mexico, where um, the group which is fighting the Mexican government uh, um, over the livelihood issue of the uh, forest dwellers there, they have a far more open method of settling their issues. I mean, something like that, I think, should be evolved for. And with these two things in place, I think uh, a lot of problems can be solved. I just want to ask this. See, in your book and in your talk, uh, you know, you talk about lot of successes, but then you also appear to be a person always in doubt about so many things. There's a little bit of a uh, contradiction because, you know, as, as uh, Ram said also, many of us look at you as somebody who has achieved a lot. So why this, you know, self-doubt? I try to speak to understand. Thanks. No, I, I think you should always have self-doubt. Self-doubt is the sign of a healthy personality. Imagine, uh, uh, getting led by your successes and thinking that you've done something. Always one should see what one hasn't done, no? what, where one has failed. And nobody knows that better than the person who has done it. So I know where I have failed, which is why I think in my book, I, I try to be a little honest and say these are the things I couldn't do because I didn't have support, I was not that strong a person or circumstances were just not, you know, thing. I think that's important. Uh, to be honest about oneself. If you're not honest about oneself, how can you critique anybody else? What is the most gratifying instinct you come across? Gratifying and satisfying instinct you come across? Many years after I left Ibrahim Patnam, many years, maybe 20 years after I left Ibrahim Patnam, and actually I wouldn't even go for weddings there, I was so frightened that they pulled me back into uh, issues and 
I couldn't afford to get arrested or jailed because I had a child to look after. So 20 years after that, when my daughter was in um, doing her graduation, uh, one lorry load of people came to the house and said, uh, this 120 acres of land that we've got, we've been able to sell part of it to government. Government will take it and giving us so much compensation. And so we're very happy. So we've come to thank you for it. And then, you know, Shalwal uh, Gapparu and uh, everything were very nice. And then they left and went. And then my daughter said, you know what uh, they gave me? Uh, they gave me an envelope with some money in it. So I said, yeah, it must be 5,000 or something. She said, no, it's a check for 3 lakhs. So then I ran behind them, went to the lorry where they all said, how can you give, you know, this is, you can't do this. You, I didn't work for money. You don't have to give me money. I can educate my daughter. All this went on for a long time arguments. And then they said, she's our daughter too, you know, and for her education, we are giving. And we sat for so many days. They make intricate calculations over who should get how much. And we've put aside this amount for you. And when you say you don't want it and you're going, okay, we'll take it back. And then so much more quarreling will come up among us. How are we going to reshare this three lakhs? So you'll be the cause for a whole lot of quarrel among us. And so you have, so I, I took that money and I, I was unhappy at that time. But later on, I felt very good. I said, oh my, after 20 years, there's so much love. They've come and... Uh, um, you know, this money is a token of that love. They needn't have come, they needn't have, you know, thanked me for anything. It was not necessary at all. But I was very warmed by that. So, I mean, because it is like fairly recent, I remember, but there have been so many incidents where um, I must have been so gratified by their love. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, you said that the youth today not actively participating in direct uh, movements or mobilizing as such. So, I myself being a millennial, I've seen that even if you go to some movements, those are only for that evening or a couple of days, showing placards and all that and that ends there. So, do you see uh, the youth leading any movements in the time to come? Like the one of the Mandal movement or the Naxal movement where youth was actively involved? And if yes, what are the qualities or what are the essential things that youth need to invite to, you know, because we are not exposed to direct uh, mobilizations now, what are the qualities we, uh, we need to have that thing to come back? And do you see a role of the left parties to lead and provide a platform for the youth? Before I answer your question, um, there's someone leaving. I thought I would like to pay tribute to him. Yeah, Mr. Ch Mr. Chakravarti is leaving. Um, if Mr. Chakravarti had not been there, much of the book would have taken a very different turn. Um, I hope he doesn't mind. Um, I never thought I would see him in person. Mr. Chakravarti is the person who has joined Collector in Rangaradi district in 1958. <laughs> Wrote the judgment that gave the Jambargunam people uh, that gave, that made, that, that showed that the land was government land. And much later, when I came there, 30 years later, his judgment formed the cornerstone for our fight. And I never thought I would be able to meet him. And on behalf of all the people there, I want to pay tribute to this <laughs> gentleman. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to leave because uh, please uh, understand that I'm 84 plus. And uh, I have a few minor head problem, major ones. So I thought I would leave after your speech and the conversation. I found it very engaging and uh, very informative. I have one question to ask you. I don't know whether it is covered in your book, I have not seen your book. These days, there is a move towards homogenization of culture. What books you read, what food you should take, what resin you should practice, what you should do personally, all that is getting homogenized. That is, there's a move towards it. Our country is a heterogeneous country of different cultures, different faiths, different beliefs, different work, working uh, cultures and so on. There is a biological maxim that says heterogeneity leads to evolution. Homogeneity 
leads to extinction. What's your take on this? I agree with you and I don't think anybody can uh, force India to be homogeneous, India or its people. Thank you. I'm so thank you. I'm so sorry, the last question. The last question someone asked was it's actually you're you're asking me to give a prescription. How can I give a prescription at my age? You should know what you should do, you know, uh, what you should do. And I also think you shouldn't ask elders and listen to them. You know, I've also become ossified in my own way. So how can you ask me? You should look around you for your own answers. I, that's what I'd say. I'm, uh, I have a slightly higher level of question. Uh, I'm Sanjay. Uh, as they say, uh, if lions had their historians, the tales of the hunt would be very different. Uh, a couple of years back, I read a book called Night March, uh, which was by, uh, I don't remember her name, Al Pasha. Uh, it was a fascinating insight for me. That was the first time I had got an insight into the life of a Naxal, the sense of purpose, and the amazing amount of, like you say, violence and injustice which is meted out to them uh, from the state, corporate sponsored, including up to some of the seemingly largest corporates today, have exploited the local, the Adivasis, the landowners uh, for their rents. So my question is, uh, I just bought your book and I would love to read more about it. But my question is, how can civil society, how can folks like me who have led a, I'm a chartered accountant, corporate, startups, etc. Uh, get much more opportunity to understand some of these issues because media today rarely covers any of these uh, areas in a manner uh, which is true or honest or which brings out what really is happening on the ground. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? What can be done? Thank you. One is there are plenty of books and two there are plenty of reports brought out by very brave journalists who stay in that area and who report. In fact, there's a and there are also people who work in that area. In fact, there's a girl from Hyderabad, uh, Shriya um, Khemani. She works somewhere in Jagdalpur, has been working in Jagdalpur in these areas. So, and I'm sure they must be coming back for holidays, their friends must be around here. So, talking with people like that, reading those reports, and all those people are accessible to you on email, etc. And then finding out in what way you can connect, you can help, reach out, and your own friend circle to make them, you know, a little more sensitive to these issues. I think there's a lot that can be done. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I'm Naeem. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you about your education. How did your education help you to overcome some of these, you know, uh, contradictions in life, particularly? Contradictions, later contradictions. <laughs> okay, uh, early contradictions. I studied science in school, and so science was very important. Uh, science was very important for me to make my first break with. Uh, tradition because I come from an orthodox Brahmin family where, um, where during menstruation you're kept aside for three days and then on the third day you have this head bath and then you're supposed to have become uh, you know pollution is supposed to have gone off and you can join and all in everything and then uh, it's supposed to be the it's a menstrual curse and so when I read in my uh, biology textbook what menstruation is all about um, I, I mean, I could um, pick up cudgels with my mother, you know, why should we do all this? This is exactly what it is. Then my mother would also say, if you sit next, to, I, used to, I used to talk with a lot of boys. I was in a co-ed school later. You sit next to a boy, she'd get pregnant. I'm sure lots of um, uh, women here would have heard that too. You sit next to a boy, you'll get pregnant. This is because they want you to keep away from boys and you know marry the man they tell you to marry and also not get pregnant and then your textbooks tell you how people get pregnant so there's so many things in which my science textbooks in uh, uh, school taught me that was my first break with tradition and after that also I mean I've been reading books and books are uh, such great teachers when you have a doubt and you read someone else's account of a movement, someone else's memoir, so many things become clear. Why should you do what you have to do? 
and uh, how did someone else do could you uh, you know you, you don't have people whose brains you can pick but books are um, uh, represent people whose brains you can pick uh, pick so all through books have been like my mainstay so to say i've been learning and i continue to learn from books all the time so peter the last question would be that uh, you've not spoken about your experience in the hyderabad book trust uh, you just spoke about books but i think that one more of the unfinished questions of wrong there so uh, uh, among other things i have mentioned in the beginning your book is a wonderful written book did it help me in hyderabad book trust during that period i mean the last 20 years and how has book publishing changed and what are the new challenges we have see i work in telugu book publishing and uh, after the in this uh, century at least from 2000 telugu publishing has gone downhill there may be many people who disagree with me but largely what has happened is uh, state governments have also introduced english medium but even before that a very concerted movement movement by uh, dalits and dalit intellectuals to have dalits join um uh, english medium schools which actually is a wise move considering that all of us also send our children to english medium schools but to that extent what has happened is um we have a very strong dalit component in our publication and now we find people coming and saying where is this in the we want an english translation of this book and this has been a persistent demand from the last 20 years and generally also if you see now uh film scripts are written in roman telugu film scripts are written in roman short stories are written in roman uh, in the in the web magazines whatsapp conversations are written in roman so i don't know how far telugu script will be used telugu uh, will be um, you know and once a script dies how far will the language live or is it only the films that are keeping our, our language alive whatever coming out in films so i don't know about that but uh, right now uh, maybe the because telugu publishing has been so disappointing over the last 10 years maybe that encourage me to write a book to get out of the mire that we are in uh, or i really don't know whether i am being pessimistic because some things are beyond me it's also that when you get older you don't have the energy to break uh, an impasse when you face it maybe that's the job for younger people to do uh but one of the things we are considering now in publishing is to launch an english imprint of the hyderabad book trust to bring out english translations of the books that come out both in telugu and dakkani and which means not only will the literature of this area have a wider reach but also uh, younger younger people of this area the younger generation will have some connect with what is there in our literature by reading it in english so this is broadly what is happening over the last so many years good evening you have been a hero in the university still are uh, lovely to see you one thing are you also do you also feel very unhappy when you see the telugu book is sold at 40 or 50 rupees and the translation in english costs a lot lot more and uh, where does this money go does it go to the translator does it go to the original writer It always saddens me to see that because whenever I pick a, pick up a book in Telugu, it's very cheap, but the translations are expensive, and I would like to know whether the writer gets part of it. It's not that actually Telugu books are more expensive to produce because usually we translate them from English into Telugu. So there's a component of translation that you have to pay. Now English language publishers don't pay the translator; they pay some royalty, but the royalty is seven percent of the. Uh, net that comes in so english language publishers have a uh, the money goes to the publishing house and so which is why you see these people sitting in delhi they have fancy uh, five star lunches they have fancy literary fests where people are put up in five star hotels and they fly you in and out because that's where all the money is and but the the problem is not so much with them as the problem is with us we are snobs we are willing to pay some 10 times more for an english book but for the telugu book ah takko ki endu ki yo you know 25% like you argue you know bargain with the poor vegetable vendor for uh, vankai and tomato they bargain with us for an uh, telugu book but the same thing in an english book you won't dare to bargain because you know um, those are those are elite stuff and you want to be a snob like them democratic centralism was a single weapon it's which the left 
this time it's a by actively sabotaging debate and discussion. Uh, after retirement, I have been serving uh, uh, shortages with CPI, CPI, and not beyond that yet. Uh, I find that among the sort of discussion in taking a decision in these two parties, it is something special to these two parties or because they are less uh, uh, sort of uh, leftist than the movement in which you are a part of a demon. Things have have things improved otherwise. I just my my own illusion that CKCPM is more of a discussion. Because you are a retired chief secretary, that's the impression you get, that's the impression they want to give you. Yes. They want to pretend that they are democratic. I don't think the CPI and the CPM are any better than the left. They are only able to present a better facade. For example, some, um, I think some six years ago, the CPM made a big play for a Dalit Bahujan alliance. If you remember, they got Kanchaile out. Uh, to canvas election, there was a big hoo-ha and we thought Array, for the first time now leftists will acknowledge uh, Ambedkar and you know there might be some possibility. All that got dropped without a discussion, how is that? There no discussion, now nobody talks about it any longer. Now all that is out and the people who advocated for it in the party, they are also out. So what happened to it? Why was there no discussion? So the left can change its policy as and when it wants and Nobody can say a thing, even in a place like Kerala, when uh, Gauri, Gauri Amal was supposed, Gauri Amal was such a tall figure, when she was to become the CM, because she was Irava and they wanted somebody from the uh, upper caste to come, there was, so, there was so much of sabotage of those, that thing. Where was the discussion about that? I don't think that uh, uh, this, the CPI, CPM are more um, what you say, sophisticated in keeping these discussions away from public thing. The ML are more raucous lot. They get everything out into the open because they talk about it so openly. I wouldn't agree with you, sir.